Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Um, well, surprises, right? Some of us like them, some of us don't. I am, my name is Jessica, and I don't like surprises at all. I probably could be with the fact that I have control issues, um, and I like to know what's happening at all times, um, but I just I just don't like them. I don't like being ambushed. I don't like, you know, anything coming at me. I don't like it at all. I always say I, I, I spend way too much time watching these videos on Facebook and Instagram. Don't judge me. Um, that's like my downtime at night. Sometimes I just watch them because I love watching them, but I always say I'm not going to be the girl that is walking along on the side of the street have you seen those videos and there's like people hiding like all covered or camouflage and like I don't want to be the ah, girl like I don't want to be that girl I'm going to be the girl that's going to be walking and you come at me I'm like I'll punch you that's what you get for surprising me okay like that's it's probably I should fix some things in my heart but that's just I just don't like surprises and as we were preparing, you know, for today, my husband and I were talking, and we were talking about how in life sometimes you can, surprises come at you, you know, from every angle, all the time. But I started thinking about my own life, and I started realizing that I was living my life kind of in a, in a state of perpetual surprise. You know, there are some things, there are surprises in life that are avoidable, and there are surprises in life that are unavoidable. The surprise in life that is unavoidable is if I don't put gas in my car and I'm driving down the street and I keep driving, 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 well, guess what's going to happen? If my car runs out of gas, it's no surprise, right? It ran out of gas because I didn't put gas in it. That's, it shouldn't be a surprise. Um, the surprise would be if somebody came and took it and, you know, like then I wouldn't have any gas. Um, so there are surprises that are avoidable, surprises that are unavoidable. And I want to focus today on the avoidable surprises, because my husband's going to talk about the unavoidable ones, but in my life, in my personal life, this past, especially this past year, from like today to like you know June of last year, I was I was really angry. I was in a state of like I don't I don't like this. I this wasn't supposed to happen. I was really mad at God. I was really mad at people. I that's probably why I wanted to punch people. You know, even if you didn't mean to surprise me, I just wanted to like you know. I it was just a really bad time in my life, and I started to think like, well, why was that? You know, and and the questions of why is this happening and all of this, they, they were all going through my head. Um, but as I, you know, began to read God's word and, you know, for those of us that are doing the, the challenge, you know, if, if we're reading God's word, then you know that God has prepared us for things. There are avoidable things. There are avoidable surprises, you know, in the Bible in Ecclesiastes and side note, if you're going to read Ecclesiastes, you better be sure that you know your identity in God. Okay. And also know the context behind it because Ecclesiastes can be a little bit depressing. Because here's what happens. King Solomon, the wisest man on earth during this time, is writing this, right? But he is writing this after a time of there, he had been getting things together in his kingdom. He had built things. He had gone to wars. He had, he had won wars. He was in a time in his life where he was, you know, there was not much going on. So he was thinking. He was pondering. When we think and ponder, sometimes we say things. Um, and he was everything, after every sentence, like after every, like almost every paragraph, he's like, but life is meaningless. Life is meaningless. So don't read it if you don't know who you are in God, okay? Life is not meaningless. This was just the point that he was making. Uh, so here he is. He's talking about life. He's pondering about life. And he's saying that there's a time for everything. Other than John 3, 16, Ecclesiastes is one of the most widely used verses in the Bible. There's a time, you know, where we can go through it. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 8 talks about all the times, right? For everything, there's a season, a time for every activity under the sun, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to harvest. I mean, some of us know this by, by, by heart. A time to kill, not people, just at a time to heal, a time to tear down, a time to build up, a time to cry, and a time to laugh. I'm, I, this, this is confession time. I'm one of those people that sometimes will laugh at the most inopportune moments. Not at what's happening, just like something internally going on in my head. But there's a time for that, Jessica. Don't laugh out loud when things are, if somebody falls, my first, I want to laugh. Sorry. <laughs> like, that's just, you know. But there's a time for that. First, you check, make sure that they're okay, and then you can laugh, okay? Um, a time to grieve and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to turn away. A time to search, a time to quit searching. Time to keep and a time to throw away. 
Come on, declutter. A time to tear and a time to bend. <clears throat> a time to be quiet and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. Not people, just things. A time for war and a time for peace. So if there's a time for everything, you know, I began to say to myself, okay, well, then what's going on with all of this surprise? Why do I feel like I'm just surprised, surprised, surprised at every turn? And the unavoidable thing that I began to see, and I see everywhere, I began to see this everywhere, is that there are seasons in life. We, turn, we use that word so much, but like, what does that really mean? Well, that means that there are cycles. Okay, then I began to see cycles everywhere. I was like, oh my gosh, there's a water cycle, right? It talks about it in Ecclesiastes too. It's a science thing. Water goes, it comes down from the, from the clouds, it come, comes down to rivers, to oceans, it evaporates, it goes right back up into the sky, and guess what? It comes right back down, right? Beautiful cycle, the butterfly cycle. If you have kids in school, like we study this and it's beautiful, we see them, it goes from a little hungry caterpillar that eats everything in sight, then it goes into the cocoon and then it emerges as a beautiful butterfly. There's that cycle. There's the woman cycle. Yeah, right? Yeah, he knows. There's a woman cycle. It comes every single month, people. If we're regular, if not, it, it still comes. It comes. So for those times, let's prepare. When the chocolate's on sale, buy it. Okay, stock up. Husbands, there's, there's, there's your note. If you see chocolate at the checkout, so just get it. Put it in the freezer. Just, it, it, it'll bless you, I promise you. For me, it's hot fries. I don't know why. If you see me eating those, just stay away. No, just kidding. Um, no, but so there, there's a time, there's cycles for everything, right? I also think that there's a man cycle. I don't know what it is yet. Scientifically, I haven't studied yet, but there's a man cycle. Somebody said, like, it's the motorcycle. Maybe that's it. I don't know. But cycle as humans, as we go from infancy to adulthood, right? You go from a baby to childhood to adolescence to, you know, to adult to mature adults. And then, you know, we, and then we go on, right? There's, there's cycles in everything. And I thought, okay, there's, there's something to that cycle, 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 everything happens. Well, in Ecclesiastes 3.15, it says, what is happening now has happened before, and what will happen in the future has happened before. Interesting. Because God makes the same things happen over and over again. Cycles. He is so good to us that he prepared us. It's happened before. It's going to happen again. What's going to happen in the future has already happened before. So if we get used to it, then we're not living in a hypersensitive, a constant state of, you're in a constant state of surprise. It shouldn't be a surprise. There are certain things in life, certain seasons in life that it shouldn't be a surprise to us. Today is June. Today I woke up and I went outside and I was like, oh my God, it's hot. Well, guess what? It shouldn't be a surprise. It's summer. The axis of the earth is tilted in such a way that the sun is shining down on it really hard, right? It's summertime. But we go, I, I bet you, you're going you're gonna to say it this week, like, man, it's hot. Yes, it's hot. It's summer. Get used to it. Prepare, right? In the wintertime, we hear this especially in California because it doesn't usually happen, but in nature, this is what happens. In wintertime, you know, in that time, it rains, how silly do we look? How silly do I, you know, I sound, oh my God, it's raining. Yeah, it's supposed to be raining. It's supposed to be happening. But we're so desensitized from that because we live in a, you know, in a space of comfort. We don't see those seasons on the outside. So sometimes we don't think about that. The commodities of life have shielded us from that. But today I want to point out that even in your life, and we say this all the time, I, I was saying this this year, oh man, this is just a season. I'm down, I'm this, I'm that. I'm going to get through it. I'm just going to get through it. Or you wake up and you say, okay, I just need to get through this. I just need to get through this season. But how many of us have wasted so many years of our life just getting through things, living through life? Have you enjoyed it? If, you look, if I look back, I'm like, I haven't enjoyed any of that because I just wanted to get through it. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to talk to people. I don't want to do anything. I just want to get through it. It was like a tunnel and I'm like, I'm under it and I just want to get through, but I'm not enjoying what's happening on the outside. Four cycles, right? Four seasons, I mean, in the cycle. The first, the first one is spring. If you think about it, if you flip it, you know, there are supposed to be things that are supposed to be happening during these cycles, during these times. In the spring, the spring equals birth. Embrace the new. Embrace it. And cycles happen even in the lifetime, right? When you first get married, when you first have that new relationship, when you first go into that new job or that new school, everything is new. Embrace it. Learn. That's another thing. Learn. If you're taking notes, take notes. Learn from this. 
when my husband and I first got married, yeah, we dated, yeah, we got to know each other, but there were still a lot of things that you don't know about a person until you live with them when you're married, okay? So, you know, it, it was great. It was awesome. Got to new, learn new things. You know, he's a morning person. I'm a night person. Okay, good. Good to know that. We're not going to have deep conversations early in the morning or late at night because otherwise, whoa, it's not good. Right? We learn new things. But what happens is, you know, sometimes, like, we just, we want to stay in the new, right? Seven, how many? Seven, we've been married seven years? Okay. I have to ask him. He's the numbers guy. <laughs> seven years, sometimes you're like, oh, my gosh, you're not the same person. No, you're not the same person anymore because after time, people change. Instead of going to find somebody new, how about you learn about the, new, the person that's, you know, in front of you because they've changed. That's a new cycle that happens. I'm happy that I'm not married to the man that I married seven years ago. He was good and awesome and he was great, but he doesn't know the things that he knows now. Here we go. Then we go to summer. In summertime, there's plenty. Summertime is the season, it's where we get to live. Summertime is the season where we are seeing people enjoying what they have done from the previous cycle. It's when we see people going, oh man, those Instagram pictures of people going on vacation, sometimes they get me, right? Ah, they're in Hawaii. Oh, they're in the Bahamas. Ah, oh, they're here, they're there, you know, all of that. But what those people did was they preserved so that they can persevere. This is the time that you enjoy. Yeah, this is great. This is the time where we're saying, yes, God, your promises are yes. And when you really mean it, right? This is where your theme song for the summer is, everything is awesome. Everything is like, it's blasting, it's blaring. You got your summer jams on. You're going to the, to the beach. You're going to, like, everything is good, right? This is also the time where most people will abandon God. Not physically, but mentally. We began to see the fruit of our labor that God has provided, that God has helped us. And then we just, we just eat it. We're just eating it. But no, the Bible says that we, we, we got to save. We got to store. We got to do that. Everything is fresh right now. Everything is ripe. But what happens if you leave fruit out? This is a time back in the day where people would preserve it, literally can it, freeze it, save it, store it, read it, keep it, take it and live it. Then comes fall. It's change. As much as I like to say I'm a spontaneous person, I don't like change. This is a time that is hard. It's hard for us, but we because we see it as a loss. Leaves are falling. Things are going away. There's no more flowers. There's no more this. There's no more that. But this is a time where a loss can be a win. This is sometimes the time in your life when you feel like, man, my friends have left me. My family's not here. Especially if you just graduated from high school or college. Like, man, that, that, that safety of that dorm, the safety of your mama's house, the safety of, you know, you're getting everything paid for, <laughs> it's not there anymore, right? But this is where a loss can be a win. Now you get to go out and do things. Now you get to go and be what God has called you to be. This is also where we start eating the fruits of what we preserved. What Nick was talking about, what God was doing in his heart, in, his heart, in, the, in the season of plenty, he was saving it up, right? And then the Bible says that we cannot reap where we don't sow. <clears throat> that wasn't actually in the spring too. Um, in the springtime is the time to sow. Yes, we get to enjoy new things, but it's also the time to be sowing things. Um, have you ever noticed that, like, in springtime, pollen is abounding and everybody's sneezing all over the place? Well, that's because nature is doing its thing. It's sowing for the future, right? And I, and I do want to point out, I do want to say that I'm not talking about, you know, when I talk about loss in the fall, when I talk about those things, this is, this is just a regular cycle of life. Again, my husband's going to talk about the unavoidable things. There are things that happen. If there, but even, even in loss that is untimely, there is, there is, there's a cycle for that. There's a grieving time. You've got to take that time to do that. But that's a whole other thing. Um, this is just for like our regular cycle in life, okay? In the winter. Winter is coming. Yeah. <laughs> I don't watch it. I just know about it. <laughs> I just hear it all the time. But I'm like, yeah, winter is coming. Winter is coming. Winter does come. This is the time that we can mistake. This is the time that we can say, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is the time that I really wonder, did Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, th th this was his winter. He knew that winter was coming. He knew that he was going to die. He knew what was going to happen, but he was preparing. 
And I, and I really think about this is a time where your trust, your faith is really tested. This is the time. But this is also the time to dream because growth happens inside, underground first. The seeds that you planted in the springtime, they're growing on the inside. They're developing those roots. But we don't see the change happening. We don't see any. This is the time that in my life I said, God, where the heck are you? You said you would never leave me. You said you would never forsake me. You said all of these things. And where are you? I don't hear you. I don't feel you. I don't, I, I, I just don't. This is the time that, you know, in nature, bears do go into a cave. But I was the bear that went to the cave and stayed there for a long time because I didn't want to come out. This is also the time that if we're not careful, we can just be in there. We can stay there. We can create our own winter and say there is no God. There is no this. There is no that. You know, I have, I have two beautiful girls. They're amazing. They're six and three. Um, they're kind of cute. They really are. I like them. They're funny too. And people always ask us, you know, is, is that it? You know, if, what about more kids for you? And I'm like, no, 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 I don't want to have any more. You know, this just two is enough for us. You know, just, it, we're, we're good. But the reality is, is that my winter with them, when they were being born, was horrible. I love them, but oh my God, they tried to kill me. Both of them did. I, hyper, hyperemesis gravidarium was not like, you know, known until the princess had it, right? That means that you're throwing up literally the whole time you're pregnant. The whole entire stinking time. I could not eat, and I like to eat, and I was really mad about that. Like, I not even, not even my favorite foods. I was coming to church on Sundays, and between services, I was throwing up. I would eat something one day, and then the next day, I was, I was fine, you know, a little bit fine, and then the next day, I would try to eat the same thing. Nope, throw it up. And like every, like every half an hour, I lost a lot of weight. Maybe I should get pregnant again. No, okay. <laughs> I lost a lot of weight. There was just, you know, just, it was, I was going into the, into the doctor. I was having IVs like every, almost every two weeks. I didn't make it to full term. I lost, I don't know, I don't know what happened. I, you know, she was, so that was my first one. The second one, I was like, oh, we got this. I got hyperemesis gravidarium, doctor. I'm going to throw up the whole time. What do you got? What do you got? Give me something. I don't want to be throwing up this whole time. I was good for about six months. And then what started happening is I, my, I, I literally became allergic to my daughter. Asthma, I was like the one in the 100,000, I don't remember the number, but that some normally people get better, I got worse. I couldn't breathe. I was like, <gasps> I can't breathe. I couldn't do it. Not just because, you know, I was able to eat a little bit more for this one, but she, so I was like, but imagine, imagine if we walked around with only the story of winter. If I was to tell you, don't get pregnant. Who, if somebody just got married, don't get pregnant. Don't have kids. It's going to kill you. Don't do it. Civilization would end. But what do we walk around doing? There is no God. He left me. There's no leaves on the trees. There's no fruit on the trees. There's nothing. But it's like, no, it's just the season that you're in life. Don't just go through it. Don't just live through it. Do something in it. Create new things. Do something new. You know what, you know what we're doing today in the summertime? We plan for it in the wintertime. EFN that we have coming up, that has been planned from a long time ago. Vision. Remember we did the vision board? How many of you still have your vision board? That was from before, so that way you can have vision for new. Create new things, dream new things, grow new things. And then it begins all over again. Then you get, you get the new birth. Then you get to live it and enjoy it. You get to sing a shout. But from there, you're going to preserve that so that in the fall, so that in the winter, you can still sing and shout. You can still sing God's praises. You can still shatter from the mountaintop that God is good. He has never left you. He has never forsaken you. He is always with you. You're not just only going to get through the season, but you're going to live it and you're going to enjoy it. You're going to learn from it. And those are the surprises that are going to be, that you're going to be okay with them. Okay? It's all my time I have for today. I could talk more, but I'm not going to. Because now my job. husband is going to do it. Awesome, awesome. I think it's ironic that uh, surprise was actually her idea, the title. And it's funny because she hates surprises. And she hates surprises because she hates being ca caught off guard. Because she, she says, it, like, if she uh, had her choice, she would be an undercover spy or a detective. So she can see things coming from, like, a mile away. And because of that, she hates surprises because she spoils them. And she doesn't like the anxiety of it. So no one could ever surprise her. If you're ever thinking of surprising her, don't do it. But as I was thinking about it, I was like, okay, she doesn't like surprises. I started thinking about myself. I'm like, Dang, do I really like surprises? And, and thinking about it, I'm like, I, I don't think so. Like, 
when, when, when you're in a situation where you're surprised, you have to control your response. Like, how, how do you respond to a surprise? Someone throws a party for you. They're excited. You see people that you haven't seen in years. And they're like, surprise. And, you know, I'm just there. Like, woo. What do you do? Like, you can, what if you don't cry from surprises? Like, what, like, how hurtful is it if someone's surprised? They put all this effort in, and you're just like, oh, man, here we go again. Another surprise, another party. Like, surprises force you to have a response period like they're good and that could be birthday party surprises that could be surprises of life whatever that looks like but surprises are going to force you to have a response some kind of reaction some kind of initial action that you're going to take the thing about that is that that first initial reaction is probably the truth of what's really inside so once it comes out there's no taking it back once it comes out everyone knows how you feel about that moment when you hear something that you don't like to hear and you roll your eyes, married people, you can answer this for me. Does your spouse, is there a reaction from them? When you, when you roll your eyes and you hear something you don't like to hear, when someone shares with you something that, that, that may, maybe you were offended by and, and you don't like it, so you flare up, some people turn red, some people say things, and, and, and you, you give a response that's your initial reaction, what we try to do is we try to cover that response up and, and do something else to kind of take the attention away from it. We maybe say a joke. Maybe we, we make another comment. Maybe we take the attention off us and put it on them. Maybe we strike back and say something to offend them. I don't know. But, but there's going to be an initial response period. And that initial response is going to reveal what's on the inside. The thing is, is that that surprise element that's unavoidable. It, it was going to happen. It was going to catch you off guard. There's nothing you could have done to prevent it because you didn't know it was coming. Now, when you think about that idea that you don't, we don't always know what, what's going to come. We don't, always, we don't know what surprises are going to come next. We don't know what life has for us. We're not all knowing like God, so we can't predict what's going to happen in the very next moment. And because of that, there's an element of surprise that's always going to be. But what if... What if we got a little smart and we decided to take the element of surprise and use it as our own tool for success? Here's what I mean by that. Let's go to Joshua chapter 8. See, the, the beautiful thing of surprises is that um, surprises will create a response and you have an opportunity when that response comes to learn from that, either to never do it again or, oh, I just learned something new about myself that I'd like. I'm going to do this again next time this happens. However, you have to remember that when you respond to a situation more than once, it's no longer a response. Now it's your attitude. And then when you respond to that same thing more than twice, it's not just your attitude. Now that's your character. And if you're still having the same reaction to the same thing that's happened over and over and over and over and nothing has changed in your response, that's no longer your attitude, your character. That's just who you are. It's who you've developed yourself to be, whether good or bad. It's who you conditioned yourself to be. And I love when she pointed out in Ecclesiastes that it says that things that have happened before, they'll happen again over and over again. God will always give you an opportunity in seasons for your responses to teach you something about yourself that you either have to change or that you have to elevate, make better. Joshua chapter 8, Joshua takes an opportunity an opportunity to defeat the city of Ai that once defeated Israel and caught them off guard. But he has an opportunity now to gain the victory that they need in order to, to overtake the city. And God gives Joshua a certain command. He gives him a command that, Joshua, you're going to set an ambush against this city. In other words, you're going to set a surprise attack. And so the element of surprise is now flipped and now it's an opportunity for them to have the upper hand on the enemy and here's what it says so joshua and all the fighting men arose to go up to ai and joshua chose thirty thousand mighty men of valor and sent them out by night and he commanded them behold you shall lie in ambush against the city behind it do not go very far from the city but all of you remain ready and I and all the people who are with me will approach the city. And when they come out against us, just as 
before, I'm going to come back to that, we shall flee before them. And they will come out after us until we have drawn them away from the city, for they will say they are fleeing from us just as before. Then you shall rise up from the ambush and seize the city, for the Lord your God will give it into your hand. Now, I want us to look at this word ambush because God commanded Joshua to set an ambush. I think sometimes we look at ambush as this negative word, like ambush uh, is, is something that happens against us, rather than it can actually work for us. It can actually help us get ahead of the same stupid cycles that we tend to go through that hurt us. An ambush can actually set us up to be better people than we've ever been before in our life. Ambushes can be the very thing that catapults us in our destiny of who God has called us to be and allow us to navigate through the troubles of life. Because the truth is that Jesus says, take heart, be of good courage, because trials will come, but I've overcome the world. And so the trials are going to happen. The surprises are going to happen. The pain's going to exist. And so because of that, God commanded Joshua to set an ambush so that he can now get beyond and get above the enemy, have the upper hand. But ambush is simply to attack by surprise from a hidden place. So when God commands Joshua to, that he's going to rise up from the ambush, what he's saying is Joshua... You are going to rise up from this hidden place. And when you rise up from this hidden place, you're going to carry a victory with you. It's going to lead to your victory. It's going to lead to you overcoming the enemy. It's going to lead to you finally defeating this enemy that's been hunting you down, chasing you down, that's been giving you a hard time. The very thing that's trying to pull you back into your comfort is the very thing that you're going to use to finally overcome it. And so to ambush is to attack by surprise from a hidden place. Listen, it's going to be in your secret place with God that he will prepare you with the very strategy you need to overcome these obstacles that have been holding you back for way too long. It's in the secret place when you're spending time alone with God, that secret place where he knows everything about you, that place where you're able to be open and honest and vulnerable with just you and God and nobody else. That secret place where you can begin to tell God the very things that make you afraid, the very things that hurt you, where you can share experiences with God that have disappointed you. You can share experiences with God where you even feel like, I don't even trust you right now, God. But that's the secret place that he provides for you. That's the environment he allows for you to have, for you to be honest and open. So out of that secret place, he can prepare you with the strategy to win. He can prepare you with the tools you need to overcome so you're not... You're not any longer falling victim to what's going to pull you back into that addiction you spent months to overcome. That you're not going to allow this this pressure that the enemy has put just the right amount of to pull you back into a bad decision that you made months ago that you're barely recovering from now. Or maybe, maybe you made a bad business move and you got into business with the wrong person and you've been suffering for years, maybe a year, maybe two, three, four, and you've been suffering from that decision. And here the opportunity comes again for you to launch into a, a make another business decision. And the enemy is putting all the pressure because, look, the finances are here. The finances are here. They're all here, but it's a bad decision and it's not good for you and it's not going to help. But because of the pressure, you give in. The secret place is the opportunity for you to come and bring that to God and say, God, what do I need to not let this happen anymore? What do I need to not let let this thing catch me off guard like it did last time? It's only in the secret place that God will give you the tools you need to break out of your habit of negative thinking. Uh, You can't break out of a cycle of negative thinking without strategy. You can't just wake up one day like, oh, everything is awesome. Everything's just grand by golly. I'm loving where I'm going. I'm loving. I'm going to change my perspective. No, it takes strategy. And that strategy is not going to come based off of someone's opinion of how they did it. That strategy is not going to be supported just because you've been there before. How did us being there before become the only source of information we draw to when we're pressed in hard times? Oh, man, I know it. Oh, I, I've been, don't worry, I've been through the same thing. You can get through it. Yeah, but, but is that really all your sustenance? Is, is that somebody's been there before? That somebody's done it before? No, he says that 
that in the hidden place is where he would rise up from the ambush and he would gain victory over the enemy's camp. It's going to be in the hidden place with God that you're finally going to see that breakthrough you've been longing for. And when you rise up from that, man, the victory is going to come to you so easily that you're going to be able to take that and then learn from that so that you can apply that for the rest of your life. The, the idea that God will give you the strategy is because to ambush the enemy, it's really just responding to that same negative cycle that you go through constantly in order for you not to respond like you would normally respond. Ambushing the enemy is not because you're trying to prove the devil that you have the upper hand. You have nothing to prove to the enemy. To ambush the enemy is so that you can learn how to change in your response nature. Maybe you've gotten some bad financial news this past week and things aren't adding up like they should be and your first response is to go crazy to go nuts as everyone around you feels the pressure you can't no one can talk to you because you're just always upset you just always have a, a chip on your shoulder you just always have something bothering you because your response is to do that but then the new strategy that God wants to give you is for you to be able to change that because who knows the people surrounding you might actually be able to help you the people that are coming to ask you how you're doing and you give them a negative reaction, you give them like a cold shoulder, they might be the ones that God's trying to use to get you out of that. But if we're not learning from our responses, if we're not learning and gaining strategy from the secret place, how will we ever allow God to come to our rescue? How are we ever going to allow God to come to our aid? If he says he equips you with all that you need, how are we going to allow him to do that? We can't expect the strategy to come without time spent with the one who gives the strategy. Period. There's, there's no way. If, if you feel like you're in a spiritual rut, like you're just, things have been dry, the seasons have been dry, emotionally you're checked out. When you come to worship, you can't even tune into the songs. You're just thinking about what you have to do next. I, let me tell you this. You're not going to break out of that just because of what you know to do from past experience. God wants to refresh you with a fresh word. He wants to give you something new. He wants to give you a new revelation in his word. It's going to teach you something you've never done before. I don't care if you've been doing it for 20, 25 years. He wants to give you a new perspective, Amen. a new look. John 3.16 shouldn't just be John 3.16. It should be, man, that's a fresh word from God. For God so loved me. For God so loved me. It's in that time when you're, when you're vulnerable with God, that he can prepare you for what is to come next. And I'm going to start wrapping it up with this here. It's, it's interesting. Um, the enemy tends to like to put you into spin cycles. Um, and he'll, and he, he tends to like to get you into situations that seem like you're just in a revolving door. It's never going to end. Uh, uh, um, I, I've gone through this before. Here we go again. How, how many of you have, have at some point, you don't have to raise your hand, but just at some point, you've, you've been in a situation where there's this, this, you've seen it before, and you just in your mind go, oh, here we go again. Like, nothing's going to change. Nothing's going to happen. Um, I already know what to expect. I already, I already know what to do next because I've seen this happen before. And we get so comfortable we allow the, the situation to become a part of our life. It was never meant to be a permanent part. It was meant to be a season. That season has to end at some point. The reality is that there's another season waiting, but it can't come if you've already accepted this to be your life. That great season that you're waiting for to finally happen and take its place, it's not going to happen if you're allowing the current one to be it. If you're allowing that to be the one for you. If you're just coping with it and accepting it and making your place in it, don't expect a new one to come your way just because it is. That needs to die for the other one to live, for the good one to live. If you continue to read in Joshua, you'll see that God tells Joshua to set fire to the city of the enemy, to the Canaanite city, Ai. And he says to set fire to it. Now, reading that at first, I think you could, uh, you could probably start to wonder, like, wait a minute, God, so 
You gave Joshua such elaborate, such detailed strategy. You gave him such a, 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 a clear point of action, plan of action. Why would you have him go through all that just to set fire to the very thing that he worked so hard to get? Like he, he worked hard. He split up his troops and he put some troops in the front, some troops in the back. And he did all this to burn it down. Here's what I got from that. Here's what I, here's what I see in that. A lot of times we, we do change our response. We do learn from situations and we make our way out of it. And then another situation comes around again. But this time, man, it's even more tempting to respond a certain way. Oh, man, they, they knew exactly what to say that time. Like, it's even better than what they've said before to really get me to do something stupid. The way they looked at me, that, that's a whole nother look. I know they've done it before, but that was like extra, extra. That, the, the way they handled that conversation with me, the way, the way, the, 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 the the circumstances around me are looking now, they're like magnified times 10. And now it becomes a little bit extra. And what happens is, is if you never destroy the place where God freed you from, it'll always be available for you to run to. We can read that and think, oh, that's so harsh. Why fire the city? Well, because if that city was never fired, the enemy would have every opportunity to come back up and bring him the same platter to feast from. If you don't take the initiative to finally divorce the land that God has set you apart from, that freed you from, delivered you from, healed you from, it'll rise up again. And when it rises up, it might actually pull you back in. Like life could spring back up again. But he was commanding Joshua to put fire to it because he was declaring that there was a new era for Israel. There was a new time of how Israel was going to be doing things. And that strategy was very specific to how God wanted Israel to fight moving forward. Even looking at that fight, you're able to see how God really wanted Joshua to even examine his own life. See, Joshua set a, a, a camp of fighters in front of the enemy's army. And when he did that, the purpose of them for that was that they had to pretend like they were scared, like they were afraid. So when the enemy was coming at them, they had to run. They had to flee. That was their job. And when they would flee, the enemy would chase them into the forest, leaving their land behind, leaving all their possessions behind because they're like, oh, we got them this time. We got Israel. Man, there's nothing they can do. We've seen this before. We know exactly what's going to happen next. And a lot of times... Man, that's what the enemy likes to say about you. It's like, oh, man, I got this guy this time. Oh, I know exactly what he's going to do next. Yup. As soon as that person says this, they're going to respond like that. As soon as he gets this report from his boss, this is how he's going to act. As soon as his wife says this, this is exactly what he's going to do. And the enemy likes to feel like they've cornered us, like he's, like he's trapped us. Oh, I know exactly. Man, if he wants comfort, this is exactly the addiction he needs right here. This is what he's going to run to. This is what she's going to run to. But that was just a simple distraction from what was happening on the other end. That Joshua set up a part of that army behind the enemy. And the purpose of that was for the army to then attack and to come in and seize the city for their victory. And overcome and have the upper hand on the enemy. Now, that was the same army, but here's what I, I believe it represents. If you take a step back and look at the whole picture, it's almost like these are your opportunities you have when trouble comes. These are opportunities you have when the, when the seasons arrive, and maybe the season isn't the pretty one that you were waiting for. You can either take the opportunity to go right back and to flee like you have in the past, to run from the trouble, to run right back to where you're comfortable, go right back into that habit you've taken months to break, go right back into that addiction you've cast it off, go right back into that place of sickness that you've believed for healing for, go right back into those same cycles. Or you could give yourself the upper hand, come right behind the enemy and say, no, I've seen this strategy before and I know exactly what I'm gonna do. I'm going to make my, I'm gonna spend some time with God I'm going to get alone and get the right strategy that I can use to overcome the enemy when the enemy doesn't even see it coming. The enemy has no idea that I'm going to rise up to be this person that I need to be, but God has already equipped me with everything I need to do it. Everything I need. It 
seasons will come, surprises will happen. And there are avoidable surprises and there are also surprises that, that they're just going to catch you off guard. The element of surprise will do that. But here's what we have, you and I, have the opportunity to do from that. We can actually take, we can take these surprises that come and to, and to scare us and to frighten us. And we can take it and we can become better people from it. We can grow from that. We can use it to be stronger. We can use it to be wiser. We can use it to be more helpful to others. God wants you to take that opportunity and say, no, instead of running back to what I know to do, back to what's harmful, I'm going to run forward and I'm going to have the upper hand and I'm not going to let the devil try to push me around, but I'm going to gain the victory that God has for me. If today's message impacted you in any way, and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below. And we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.